Please, if you would, to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. 1 Chronicles 21. If you need the notes, just hold your hand up. The men are ready to serve you with those. Kind of in between series for Wednesday night and Sunday night, so just as the Lord leads. And God's got something special for us tonight. 1 Chronicles chapter 21. Looking at the sin, when David numbered the people. Nothing wrong, there's nothing unscriptural about taking a census, all right? There's nothing wrong with that. The issue was his motive. The issue was his heart. The issue was his reason. You say, well, but, but he numbered the people. What was wrong with that? God's got a whole book in his Bible called Numbers, all right? God's not against numbers. God's not against counting people. I mean, he does that all the way through. But it was the, David's heart. It was David's attitude. But we're going to learn some things that will help, and I believe it will salvage some homes, it'll salvage some lives, if we'll let it just speak to us tonight. So, First Chronicles 21, I hate to read so much, but we need the entire story. So, uh, Monday's a holiday anyway, so you can rest up then if you don't get any rest tonight. So, verse number 1, 1 Chronicles 21, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go, number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Joab answered, The Lord make his people an hundred times so many more as they be. But, my lord the king, are they not all thy lord's servants? Why then doth my lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Wherefore, Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Verse number 7. And God was displeased with this thing. Therefore, he smote Israel. And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I beseech thee, do away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. And the Lord spake to Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Choose thee, either three years famine, are three months to be destroyed before thy foes, while that the sword of thine enemies overtaketh thee? Or else three days the sword of the Lord, even a pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coasts of Israel? Now therefore advise thyself what word I shall bring again to him that sent me. And David said to Gad, I am in a great strait. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord. For very great are his mercies, but let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel seventy thousand men. And God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord beheld, and he repented him of the evil, and said to the angel that destroyed, It is enough, stay now thy hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and the heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Israel or Jerusalem. Then David and the elders of Israel, who were clothed in sackcloth, fell down or fell upon their faces. And David said unto God, Is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, what have they done? Let thy hand, I pray thee, O Lord my God, be on me and on my father's house, and not on thy people, that they should be plagued. Then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David, that David should go up and set up an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David went up at the saying of Gad, which he spake in the name of the Lord. And Ornan turned back and saw the angel, and his four sons with him hid themselves. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. And as David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went up, went out of the threshing floor and bowed himself to David with his face to the ground. And David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord, 
Thou shalt grant it me for the full price, that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Ornan said unto David, Take it to thee, and let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. Lo, I give thee the oxen also for burnt offerings, and the threshing instruments for wood, and the wheat for the meat offering. I give it all. And King David said to Ornan, Nay, but I will verily buy it for the full price. For I will not take that which is my, thine for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings without cost. So David gave Ornan for the price six hundred shekels of gold by weight. And David built there an altar unto the Lord, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, and called upon the Lord. And he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of burnt offerings. And the Lord commanded the angel, and he said, and commanded the angel, and he put up his sword again unto the sheath thereof. Father, help us tonight. Lord, I know that you're the same God. I know that we're the same kind of people as David was. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us tonight to understand the battle that we're in, that we'll understand the dangers that we may be in, that we would make some decisions tonight that would protect us, protect our families. Lord, and put us on the right path and keep us on the right path. Lord, I ask that you put a hedge of protection about our church and church families. So easily can we falter. So easily can we get ourselves away from you. So, Lord, open our eyes. Holy Spirit, convict us, show us, teach us, build us, Lord, that we might leave here as stronger people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. If you look at verse number 1 of chapter 21, it's an amazing statement. It says, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David. And Satan stood up. That in itself ought to put us all on guard tonight. That ought to put us all to wake up and say, there's something going on. There is a battle going on. By the way, Satan is real. I said, Satan is real. Just like God never changes, Satan has been our enemy and will continue to be our enemy. Satan is real. And here we find it says, Satan stood up. Now, if you're going to fight somebody, you stand up. I've never seen a good fight with people sitting down. Not physically, anyway. So Satan stood up to fight. Satan stood up to move. Satan stood up to do something. He went to bring about a, an issue. He went to stand up. Notice what it says. He stood up against Israel and provoked David. We all ought to be on guard tonight if Satan will stand up against us. Satan wants to stand up against the church. Satan wants to hinder the church's work. So tonight, if you get nothing else, just understand that we're in a battle and God's revealing to us tonight what happened in David's life. A man after God's own heart that would put David in such a condition that 70,000 men would die and the people would be hurt and God would bring such judgment because of what David did. So let's learn tonight and be on guard for ourselves that Satan will stand up against us also. I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in other people's life. I've seen it in church's life where Satan stands up. So tonight let's just learn from this and be on guard that we don't have to go through what David did. Are you with me tonight? All right, so stay with me. I know it's late and I know it's middle of the week, so stay with me as we look at this when Satan stood up. And let's learn what Satan wants to do in our life so we can put the things in place and guard against ourselves having the same issues. So very quickly, let's notice, first of all, David's defeat. David's defeat. In this battle with Satan, he lost. I mean, there's no other way to put it. David lost this. David, a great warrior. David, a mighty man. As a king, there was no nations that could stand before him. When he went out to battle, they won. When they fought the Philistines, they won. When he fought the enemy, they won. He was a mighty man of valor, a mighty man of army. He had a great army. And yet we find here, very simply and very subtly, he lost. He lost. The sin here, by ramification... I mean, if you stopped and somebody asked somebody, what was David's greatest sin? By the way, David had a lot of sins. He was not a perfect man. His heart was right with God. He was very quick to come back to God. But David had a lot of issues in his life. But if you ask most people, what was David's greatest sin? Most of us would probably say Bathsheba and killing her husband. That's the one that comes to mind. That's the one that seems to go on. But we find as far as ramifications go, 
This seems to be the bigger sin. This seems to be worse of it because, again, verse 14 says 70,000 men. 70,000 men. doesn't say just about the ladies. It doesn't say about the children. But 70,000 homes lost dads. 70,000 homes lost brothers and sisters and husbands. Lives were devastated. The nation was brought under judgment because of what David did numbering the people. So David's defeat. Notice, first of all, as we look at David's defeat, this mighty man who got defeated in this case, we find his adversary was determined. His adversary was determined. Satan was very determined. Satan's attack was directed. We have an adversary. Satan's our adversary. Are you out there? Satan is out after us. He's against us. He's trying to destroy us. But we notice Satan's attack was directed. In other words, he didn't use just a shotgun approach. By the way, I'm not sure too many people in California in these generations know the difference between shotguns and rifles. Shotguns puts out those little pellets. Okay, It goes broad. It covers a broader area. And so you might hit more people and you might hit more flesh, but it's not as directed. It's not as much as just one bullet from a rifle. Maybe lasers. Maybe they'd understand lasers better, all right? So it's like a... It's not like a laser. So here its attack was directed. It was like a laser. It was like a bullet. It was very specific. So let's look at this attack, this adversary. He was determined. Satan had a focus. Satan had a purpose, what he was doing. It says Satan, notice what it says, he stood up against who, class? Verse 21, and Satan stood up against who? Israel. His target was Israel. His target was the nation. His target was God's people as a whole. But notice that the bullseye was David. Notice what it says. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David. Israel was his target. It might be saying Lighthouse Baptist Church was his target. It might be like America's his target. But he provoked one person. He went after one person. He went after one individual. Moms and dads, let's understand. Let's not us be the one that causes the fall of our family. As Satan would stand up against your family, don't you be the one that causes it to fall. As Satan would stand up against the church, don't you be the one to let it fall. Yeah, notice he says he provoked David. The word provoked there in the, in the Hebrew means to, to prick, to seduce, to take away. To take away. He provoked. He seduced. He took away. Sounds like what we studied the other night about being enticed. Drawn away. James 1.14 But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And so that's what he did. He provoked. He enticed. He drew away David. He drew on David's sin nature. He drew on David's nature. He drew on David's uh, uh, weakness that David had about wanting to know the number of the people and wanting to know how powerful he was. Maybe he was just wanting to be lifted up with pride. Maybe he wanted to, to do some calculations. Maybe he wanted to see how secure he was. Maybe he had lost some faith in God and said, boy, i got to make sure I've got enough army. We don't know why, but we know that Joab figured out David's attitude was wrong because when he said, Joab, I want you to go number the people, he says, don't, don't make Israel fall. Don't make Israel transgress. Don't do this. So he was provoking David. Israel was the target, but David was his bullseye. Because David was the leader. You're a leader in your home, moms and dads, be careful. You could be the bullseye. He may be want to rise up and stand up against your family, but he's going to go after dad or mom. He'll focus very carefully. So we notice David's defeat. His adversary was determined. He said, I know who I'm after. I know what I'm doing. He stood up to do a fight. He just didn't stand around. He stood up for the attack. But secondly, we find in David's defeat, his giants were dead. His giants were dead. Go back to chapter 20 and in verse number 6. Heading in, again, the divisions in the Bible, the chapter divisions, they're not inspired. They're just put there by man to help us keep track of where we are. So we read through many times. We miss, by stopping at the end of a chapter, we miss the, the context. So in chapter 20, verse number 6, And yet there, again, there was war at Gath. 
where a man of great stature, whose fingers and toes were four and twenty, six on each hand and six on each foot, and he also was the son of a giant. We know also who else came from Gath. Goliath, all right, so these were big guys. These were giants. Gath had a, had a lot of giants in it. And so here we've got a guy who had six, hand, six toes on each foot, six fingers on each hand, and a great man. Verse number 7, And when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shema, David's brother, slew him. These were born unto the giant in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. So they had just fought another battle with a bunch of giants, a bunch of huge men that had been men of battle and very strong. And so David and his men, they defeated those giants. And he goes right on. And the next verse says, And Satan stood up against Israel. So Satan standing up against Israel handed right after the defeat of the giants. Right after gi David's giants were dead. Right after the battle with the giants were done. Then Satan stood up. Right after a great victory. Often in times in the Bible, the enemy comes strongest after a great victory. David had had his battle with the big boys. It was Goliath and then these giants, these great men, he had had his battles. Yeah, battling giants, battling big armies, battling these big fellows, that was something he, David could understand. You could see him coming. You could hear him coming. They were all over you. The issues were there. So it is in our life. Big temptations come. It's those times of quiet that we've got to be careful. Big trials come. See, a lot of times when the big trials come, whether it be disease or heartache or finances, well, we're ready for that. We understand Satan is attacking. We understand the battle. When they come in and the lawyers come call us and all those things, we understand those battles and we're ready. But now after the giants were dead, Satan stood up and provoked, enticed, drew away David. Just when he thought the battles were over. Just when it was the thought of time of quiet and of peace. Satan stood up. Well, watch out when things you think are quiet. Watch out when you think things are going smooth. Watch out when you think, when you think your battles are done. Watch out when you think the enemy is just leaving you alone for a while. Be on guard. Be on guard. Hey, we don't have to lose. Amen? We don't, but here it was. The giants were dead. His adversary was determined. He thought it was over. He thought it was all safe, but it was not. That's when Satan stood up. So after David defeated Gath, and his servants defeated Gath, and defeated the giants, and the giants were dead, then and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number. So the enemy of the giants couldn't do it, but he says, Satan says, I got another way. I'm going after David. Not only David's defeat, the adversary was determined, the giants were dead, but his defenses were down. David's defenses were down. Well, we can't let down our defenses. Are you, are you out there tonight? We can't let down our defenses. Regardless of your age, regardless of what's going on in your life, you cannot let down defenses. That's why in Ephesians 6, verse number 11, we know the passage. It says, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. David should have kept his armor on. His spiritual arm, he should have kept it on, but he let it down. By the way, that's what he did with Bathsheba also. It was time where the generals, when kings, go to war. David was supposed to be at war, but this time he stayed home and laid in bed. This time he stayed home and just relaxed. This time he let down. If he'd been in battle, if he'd been prepared for battle, he wouldn't have been in that place to see Bathsheba and fall into that. But he stayed home. He let his armor down. He got back out of the battle. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. We don't know when that day is coming. That's why you got to keep the armor on. We have to keep the armor on all the time. We have to keep the sword of the Spirit available all the time. As soon as we get up and say, well, I don't need the armor today, you'll need it. As soon as I say, I don't need the sword of the Spirit tonight, you will need it. And so David here, the, gen, the, the giants were dead. It was a time of peace. But, oh, Satan stood up and provoked, drew away David. We don't find David in this passage praying until he had to pray to get forgiveness. We don't see him focused on what he was doing. We find David defeated. How sad. A great man of war defeated. The adversary was determined. 
The giants were dead. His defenses were down. And his counselor was disregarded. His counselor was disregarded. Look at verse number three. Verse number two, David tells Joab, go number the people and let me know how many I got. Supposedly it took about ten months for them to get those numbers. And Joab answered and said, the Lord make his people a hundred times as many more. He says, if God made you a hundred times more, what difference would it make? He said, because they're all your servants. And then he says there, the latter part of verse three, why then doth my Lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? There was somebody in David's life trying to stop him. There was somebody in David's life. By the way, that took some courage from Joab to say, King David, you're going to mess up. King David, I, I'm your man, I'm your general, I'm basic, but you're messing up. Don't go that route. Do not require this. Change your mind. Alter your course. Stop. Take back the order you just gave me. You do not want to do this. There was somebody attempting to prevent him from going into sin. By the way, I thank God for people in my life that have said, Bill, you don't want to do that. You don't want to go down that path. You do not want to make that decision. You've, or you've made that decision. I think you better rethink that. I think you better back up. I think you better change your mind on that. You ought to thank God for people in your life that will have enough courage to say, I don't think you ought to do that. That's the wrong direction. That's the wrong path. By the way, it is a fearful thing to tell somebody that. And you better be prayed up and you better be right. But when the Holy Spirit leads it on your heart and your life and you see somebody going down the wrong path. By the way, it's not always too hard to see somebody going down the wrong path. Well, for a Christian lady to, to date an unchristian man, that's the wrong path. I mean, that's very clear from the scripture. It says, no, do not be unequally yoked. For a man to go after, an, for a Christian man to go after an unchristian woman, wrong direction. Wrong direction. Shacking up together? Wrong direction. Taking alcohol? Wrong direction. Taking those decisions? Wrong it's Many things we can see in somebody else's life, that's the wrong direction. And we need to be people who, by the right spirit, with love, guarding our own selves, lest we be tempted, be willing to help somebody that we're supposed to love and somebody we're supposed to be watching out for, to say, no, don't go there. So, I thank God for preachers in my life as I was growing up in the Christian faith, as I was growing and learning the Lord. They said, no, Bill, you don't want to do this. You don't go down this path. You don't tread that way. You stay on the right. You stay on the, as we saw a few weeks ago, the straight and narrow, because that leads to blessings, that leads to life. So there was an attempt of somebody who tried to prevent him. So thank God for pastors that will preach it straight. Thank God for teachers in the adult Bible classes or anywhere else that say, no, this is not right. And for, for spouses, they'll say, I think you're going down the wrong road. Let's don't go that path. And so he disregarded his counselor. His counselor said, no, don't do it. But we find his arrogance prevailed. His arrogance prevailed. So in verse 3, Joab says, don't do this. He said, there's no reason to do it. Again, God's not against the numbers. God counts people all the time. But his heart was wrong. He says, don't do this. Why cause a trespass to Israel? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. By the way, that's not a surprise. If the king wanted to do it, the king's going to do it, all right? Joab was on the verge of getting his head cut off just by bringing it up. So the king's word prevailed. Guess what? Your word will prevail also. Moms and dads, how many times have we had our hearts broken because we've tried to tell our kids. We've tried to help them. Their word prevailed. They're going to do what they're going to do. That doesn't mean you have to let them. It's a hard thing to tell your child, not in my house. You can't do that. Well, I'm going to do that, not in my house. That's a hard thing. It's a hard thing. But they're going to do what they're going to do. You're going to do what you're going to do. You might hear from the Word of God. You might hear from a preacher. You might hear from a parent. But you're going to do what you decide to do. David's arrogance prevailed. He just decided he was going to do it. Joab says, no, let's talk about this. Let's back up. And he says, no. Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Just an arrogance. Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. Don't be a fool. Let's don't be just stubborn. David was defeated. His counselor was disregarded. He disregarded the counsel. Don't disregard the counsel of the Word of God. Are you out there tonight? David, 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 as Satan stood up and provoked David, drew David away, 
David said, I'm going to do this. Joab says, no, don't. He said, I'm going to. You go do it. We find David's defeat. Boy, let's learn from that tonight. The giants were dead, but he just disregarded the counsel. Very quickly, notice David's distress. David's distress. So he had him number the people. Joab went and counted most of them. But notice in verse number 7. And the Lord was displeased with this thing. Therefore he smote Israel. And David said unto God, I have sinned, what's the next word? Greatly. David says, I didn't just sin. He said, I sinned greatly. Because I have done this thing. But now I beseech thee, do away with the iniquity. He said, it was iniquity in my life of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. So David said, I have done foolish. He said, I've been a fool, just like a fool is right in his own eyes. He said, I've been a fool, and I have sinned greatly. Verse 17. And David said unto God, Is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. He said, boy, it's me. He said, God, judge me. He said, I have sinned. He said, it's not these people's faults. It's my fault. I have done it. David knew about the shame and distress of sin. When he finally came to himself, when he, God finally began to deal with him about it, and he finally woke up and realized what he did and what God was doing, he recognized the sin, and he recognized the shame, and he recognized the distress and the brokenheartedness of what he had done. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not while we're doing the sin, it's after the sin that we get our hearts broken. It's after the sin that God begins to deal with us, and we see other people suffering because of it, that we find ourselves in that distress. So David's distress wasn't when he decided the number. It wasn't when Joab was arguing with him. It's when he went ahead and pushed through with the sin and now suffering the consequences. In Psalm 51, a very familiar passage after the sin of Bathsheba, here's what he said. He, he, David had already been through some of that. David already understood about the shame. David had already understood about the heartache. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgression. Against thee and only have I sinned. Boy, David knew about that shame of sin. So David's distress. We find David was distressed about the core of his sin. About the core of his sin. You say, what are you talking about? The fact that he sinned against God. It was sin against God. It wasn't the sin so much that he hurt somebody else, but it was a sin against God. It's what he said in Psalm 51, Against thee only have I sinned. If you remember in Genesis 39, verse number 9, For Joseph, Joseph, when she tried to get him to, to sin with her, There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How can I... How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He was distressed about the core of his sin. He sinned against God. He said, it's I that have done this. It is I that have sinned against thee. It is I that have done this evil against God. Well, let's, let's understand when we sin in the conviction, it's a sin against God. It's a sin against God. He was distressed about the core of his sin, but also he was distressed, listen carefully, because this is what gets us about the collateral damage of his sin. The collateral damage of his sin. David sinned, but Israel was getting chastened for it. David sinned, but families were being destroyed. That's why it says in verse 17, And David said unto God, Is it not I that have commanded the people to be numbered? Even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as far as these sheep, what have they done? Let thy hand, I pray thee, O Lord, my God, be on me and on my father's house, but not on thy people, that they should be plagued. He was distressed because the people were being hurt. He was distressed because of the collateral damage of the people. Now, when we sin, we sin against God, but we hurt other people. See, as, just like Joseph said to, to, to Potiphar's wife, he says, I can't do this sin against God. He said, the sin's against God. He said, but I don't want to hurt my boss. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to hurt my testimony. Here is David sinned against God, but there was collateral damage to 
his sin. See, we've all seen collateral damage to sin. You in your life may be experiencing some collateral damage due to sin. You sin, and you cause collateral damage to your children, to your spouse. Or maybe you are, listen, if you've tuned out, come back. You may be experiencing, sometimes in your life, you're the collateral damage. Sometimes you may say, God, why is this happening to me? The answer may be, it's not because of you. You're just the collateral damage. 70,000. There's probably a lot of wives that said, God, why, did, why are you this happening to me? Said, You're just collateral damage. Some of the kids may say, God, why is this happening? Just collateral damage. When Jonah was running from God and the storm was there, those fellows, those sailors, they were just experiencing the collateral damage of God dealing with Jonah. Now, we know God will always do right. Don't get mad at God. He will always do right. But also we know the Bible tells us in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to them that love God and call according to His purpose. So even if we are sometimes collateral damage to somebody else's sin as a nation or as a group or as a person, God can still work it for good. Amen. If we're loving God and doing what we're supposed to do. But we find it was collateral damage. David was heartbroken. He said because of the collateral damage, he said it was me. Don't hurt them. How can this be? Many times in our life, if we're not careful, we will let Satan stand up against us, we'll go into sin, and what will break our heart down the road is what it did to our kids, what it did to our family, what it did to somebody else. See, at the time of sin, it's what we're only thinking about us. At the time of sin, it's only us. But when the judgment comes, when the ramification comes, when the defeat comes, it's many times that collateral damage that breaks our heart the most. Can you hear it in David's voice? It is I, not these sheep. It is I that have sinned and done evil. But as for these sheep, what have they done? Let thy hand, he says, God, let your hand be on me and on my house and not these people. Again, we think of Jonah. We think of Achan. When Achan stole the silver and the gold in a Babylonian garment, not only was the result of the children of Israel died when they fought against Ai, but also Achan's family was destroyed. So let's be careful that we see the distress. The core of his sin was against God. He said, I did this wrong. He said, but the collateral damage was he was distressed about. Very quickly, notice David's dilemma. David's dilemma. Verse number 12. When I first read this, and years ago I've been thinking, I thought, well, that, that will never happen to us. It does happen to us, only on a different flavor. Look at verse number 12. So here, here's his choice. He says, choose thee, verse 11. God, God sent Gad, the preacher man, to come to David and said, get to choose three judgments, three chastenings. He said, you choose. Either three years famine or three months to be destroyed before thy foes while that the sword of thine enemies overtaketh thee or else three days of the sword of the Lord even the pestilence in the land and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coasts of Israel. Now, therefore, advise thyself. I like that. He says, figure this out. He says, you advise yourself what word I should get, bring again to him, God, that sent me. What's he going to do? He said, I give you, here's your three chances. He said, all right, judgment's coming. You've got three choices. Three choices of what your punishment's going to be. Three choices of what the chasing is going to be. In many respects, we don't get to choose God's chastening. But listen carefully. Many times, we do. And our choice on what's going to happen is based on our response to God. Are you listening to me? Our response to the sin, our response to the conviction, how we respond often determines how God needs to judge. Often responds on how what's going to happen. For example... Thinking many things in, in my children's life, or maybe in your life, you sin against God by falsifying records at work. You sin. Satan stood up against you. He went after you. Now God's bringing the judgment. It's coming down. How are you going to respond to that? We can respond God's ways, what God would have us do, or we can respond what the devil would have us do. 
and with the flesh. We get to choose how we're going to respond. Are you, are you with me? You understand what I'm saying? We're going to choose now how we're going to react. David gets a plain choice. He said, you get to choose three. Many times in our life, we get to choose what's going to happen based upon our response. Notice David's response. I like David's response. He chose God. He said, I choose God. He said, I've got all these things because God's good, God's merciful, and God will always do right. Amen? God will always do right, and God's right all the time. God is good all the time. He says, so I'm going to take God's way. I'm going to let God decide what he wants. I'm going to let God's way uh, be in my life. I'm going to let God. I'm going to always choose God. By the way, we ought to always choose God. Always choose God. Because it's better to be spanked by God than to be hugged by the devil. Are you listening to me? It's better to be spanked by God than to be loved by the world. Let's let God be God. And so David said, I'm going to choose God. I'll let God do what he wants to do. I'm going to choose God. I know his mercies. I know he's good. I know he's right. I'm going to choose God. Yes, it's going to hurt. 70,000 men were killed. He said, but I'm going to choose God. So, what we have to do is always choose God's way. Choose God. When we get ourselves in a dilemma, when we get ourselves into sin, when we get ourselves away from God, and God awakens us to the situation, and God's awakened us to where we are, let's always choose God's way. The question ought to be, not how can I get out of this, but God, what do you want me to do? Not how can I avoid this, but God, what do you want me to do? It may be confession, it may be quitting, it may, but you say, God, what is it you want me to do? And let God have his way. Amen. That's what David said. I'm going to choose God's way and let God do that. Again, I so often with my children, with my own self, it's trite, but the old expression, what would Jesus do? Many times with my kids, they, my kids weren't perfect. I know that's a shock for you. But they'd find themselves in a mess. And I said, all right, we know Jesus would not find himself in this mess. Jesus wouldn't have cheated on a test. Jesus wouldn't have stolen anything. But, but if he woke up one day and had, what would he do? And most of us would know. It might be, I guess he would go to his teacher and tell him. So I think you're right. Or I think he would go ahead and do this. Go to the principal. Or else he would do it. What would Jesus do if he found himself in that mess? So that's what I mean is when we choose God's way. Okay, God, what do you want me to do? I blew it. But now, what do you want me to do? Choosing God's way. Always choose God. Let's not fear man, but let's fear God. So we find David's Defeat. Mighty man. But David was defeated. We find his distress. We find his dilemma. He chose God. Very quickly, notice David's determination. David's determination. We're almost done. So God says, I want you... God saw what was going on. He told the angel, stop. It's enough. He didn't say go home. He just said, stop what you're doing. That's important to see in just a few moments. And so he told David, he said, okay, David, God told him through Gad, he said, I want you to go sacrifice at the threshing floor. Verse 22. And David said, and Onan, let's back up. Verse 21. And as David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went out of the threshing floor and bowed himself to David with his face to the ground. He said, oh, here's the king. So Ornan went out. Then David said to Ornan, grant me the place of this threshing floor, because that's where God told him to sacrifice, that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord, Thou shalt grant it me for full price, that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Ornan said unto David, Take it to thee. Let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. Lo, I give thee the oxen also for the burnt offerings, and the threshing instruments for wood, and the wheat for the meat offering. I give it all. He said, No, David, don't worry. He said, Don't buy it. I'm giving it to you. You're the king, and I want to have a, be a help. I want to be a blessing. I want to be a blessing to you, and I want this. He said, You can just have it. I'm giving it to you. And King David said in Ornan, Nate, he said, nope, but I will verily buy it for the full price, for I will not, notice his determination, I will not take white chads as thine for the Lord, nor, art, nor offer burnt offerings without cost. So David gave to Ornan for the place 600 shekels of gold by weight. His determination he said, I'm not going to take yours to God as mine. I'm not going to take yours to God as mine. 
Well, I want you to take that and just spend some time thinking about that this week. We can't take somebody else's to God and claim it as ours. We're real susceptible to do that. We'll take somebody else's worship to God and claim it as ours. We'll take somebody else's service to God and claim it as ours. I mean, we find people do that with their salvation. Are you saved? You're on way heaven? Yes, how do you know? Because my daddy was a Baptist preacher. They take daddy's salvation and daddy's service to, as themselves to God for their own. You can't do it. We'll give an account for ourselves before God, our service for God. So he made a determination. He was determined. He said, no, I will not do that. No, I will not take your, your things. He said, I will buy it full price. I'll pay what's worth. Because he said, I'm not going to go offer sacrifice without cost. I'm not going to take yours to God as for me. He said, I will not do that. We can't take our parents. We can't take our grandparents. We can't take our kids' spirituality for our own. But here it was. He was determined to pay whatever it cost. Listen. To get right with God. He's willing to pay whatever it costs to get right with God. Whatever the cost. He said, no, nope, not going to do it. Whatever it costs. By the way, I'm glad Christ paid whatever it costs. Wow. He paid the full price. David's defeat. Let's be careful. Well, I got all the giants slain. Watch out. Everything's quiet now. Watch out. Satan stood. David's defeat, his distress, his dilemma, his determination. Lastly, David's delight. David's delight. Verse 26. So you got the picture. Angel stopped. Judgment has stopped. God apparently didn't go the full three days. He says, nope, stop. 70,000 are dead. He says, David, go, go worship. Go sacrifice. David made a determination, I'll go pay the price, verse 26. And David built there an altar unto the Lord, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, and called upon the Lord. And he, God, answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of burnt offerings. Can you understand? David hears he's, he's worshiping God, 70,000 people are dead, the angel's been out there killing people, he's sinned, he's brought this great judgment, and so now he's offering the sacrifice, and God answered by fire. Fire came down and consumed. I don't think David said, that's pretty interesting. Good. No, I'm sure he was, wow, God accepted the offering. God has responded. God has forgiven. God is dealing. God's accepting this offering. He accepted it. Verse 27, And the Lord commanded the angel, and he put up his sword again into the sheath thereof. One last thought. It was only after his restoration that the angel put the sword away. It was still drawn. It was still over Jerusalem. God said, wait, David, I want you to go sacrifice. David was there. And he still, hey, they men still saw the angel standing over Jerusalem with the sword. If David hadn't sacrificed, I think God would have said, okay, continue. But it was only after the sacrifice, only after his obedience, only after him paying the price, only after him paying the cost, and only after God then replied from heaven with the fire, he said, okay. So as I was thinking about that, I was thinking in my life or in your life, don't quit till the sword's back in the sheath. How many times have you seen, and again, I always refer to kids, because kids is just us, and not so bad. A kid starts to get right, but stops short. And then you as a parent have to say, say, no, you didn't do it. Let's make sure we do what we need to do to be right with God. To the place where the sheath goes away. Not, okay, God, uh, sometime soon, maybe some of it, but no, David paid the price, offered the sacrifice, was obedient. God sent the fire and was accepted. Then he told the angel, put it away. Let's don't live any part of our life with the angel still waiting there with the sword. Waiting for us to get right. Waiting for us to make the change. Waiting for us to get right with God. No, no, no. Let's go all the way to where... And the angel commanded the angel, 
And he put his sword again into the sheath thereof. It's a dangerous time to stand there while the angel's waiting. Let's get it right. Let's pray. Father, we thank